What a remarkable day. I, just a few moments ago, I had the opportunity to listen to our provost um, uh, put us in the appropriate mood with his eloquence and his insight, talking about where we are in terms of change and where the possibilities lies for the future. And I was thinking it was about three months ago that Dr. Lori Beasley and her UCO commencement posse uh, choreographed another series of graduation ceremonies for a near record number of students who are now our former students and our newest alumni. In 2013-2014, over 3,200 women and men, traditional aged and non, representing the full spectrum of the human family, made the passage from UCO student to college graduate and now to novice alumni. And this week, we open our hearts and minds to the newest members of our central family, many of whom, get this, were born in 1996. Okay, yeah. In a few weeks, our colleagues in Beloit College in, in uh, Wisconsin will be putting out their famous list of where were you in 1996, but I always like to preempt them just a little bit. So refresh your memories, right? In 1996, uh, William Jefferson Clinton was president and Boris Yeltsin was starting his second term in Russia. It was the year that Clinton Gore was over Bob Dole and Jack Kemp. The first time that we had a woman Secretary of State was Madeleine Albright, and a Miss America was crowned from Northeastern State University named Chantel Smith. There was the day of the Unabomber. It was a time when the Taliban were seated in the Afghan capital in Kabul, when Benjamin Netanyahu had been elected prime minister for the first time, and the ravages of conflict plagued Bosnia, Rwanda, and Chechnya, and after Desert Storm, the U.S. was actively involved from the air in Iraq. Does this sound familiar? Unfortunately, it does. The United States was the host of the Summer Olympics in Atlanta. The Yankees were triumphant, and the Super Bowl Pittsburgh uh, was over Chicago. Braveheart was the Oscar film of the year. Ella Fitzgerald passed away. The Nobel Peace Prize went to two gentlemen, Carlos Bello and Jose Ramos Horta, for their work in helping East Timor become an independent state from Indonesia. You might remember because HTV, HDTV was introduced, and Dolly, the clone sheep, was born and the very first version of something called Java was released. <laughs> the medium household income was 35000 and if you lived in Oklahoma City, you enjoyed one of the lowest housing prices in the country. You could buy a home for about $73,000. Well, this is the birth year of our 1996 students that will be coming. We'll be welcoming them, all of us, not just in the next couple of days, but particularly next Sunday on the 17th of August, at the convocation at the Hamilton Fieldhouse at about 5 p.m., preceded by a walk, and then afterwards by a university picnic at Bronco Lake. This is a relatively, obviously a new event, relatively unknown to us here at the campus, but the convocation is our official academic welcome to our students, so we invite the faculty and the staff, and obviously our students and their parents, and all those who believe in the mission, the vision, and the values of higher education to, to come and join us. I look back over the the summer, and I was thinking that UCO, thanks to you and your students, really spanned the globe. Centralities and social media catalog your trekking from New Zealand to Russia, from Spain and Lloyd's of London to the majesty of Florence and the efficiency of Helsinki. You wore t-shirts that carried the university banner in China, Korea, and Japan. You performed works of mercy in Africa and elsewhere and discovered more about yourself as you stretched your limits to eight others. Bronze and blue and the central spirit reach from the center of the metro to the edges of the planet. You introduced young, bright, Fulbright scholars from Iraq to the power of mentoring and friendship and the wonders of Sam's Club. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I am pleased to introduce to you our Fulbright scholars that have been residents working with Dr. Wei Chen and a whole team of mentors. They are with us today and I'd like them to stand and be recognized. Would you stand please? <clears throat> we're so pleased to have you with us. At the same time, we were also uh, welcoming energetic young teachers from Spain who are going to be in the Oklahoma City Public Schools during the next three years. You fired the imaginations and future careers for dozens of the Metro's children who came here over the summer. They came here to you to learn the wonders of the world around them. They left you brimming with curiosity and affirmation that learning is exciting and their horizons are limitless. You launched another life learner. 
You represented us with optimism and professionalism and distinction at conferences and meetings across the state, the nation, and the globe. You researched, you wrote, you composed, you performed, and occasionally you relaxed and refreshed. And over that same time this past year, we said farewell. We said farewell to colleagues and friends as life and time proceeded in their inexorable rhythms. And the world swirled. Even as we are able to know more about everything, we are besieged by change. Writ large and small, combining to challenge our sense of security and autonomy and mastery and purpose, as well as creativity and adaptability. So crises, global to local, can seem beyond our control as we strive to make sense of them and the challenges we see around us. But we're in this together. All is in motion as change and those challenges that they produce permeate our professional and our personal lives. Who doesn't have a piece of that electronic marvel with them today, what we used to call a phone? Today it does everything else and occasionally rings. <laughs> it's emblematic of our life. But we are the University of Central Oklahoma and we embrace the challenge of change. And it was a year of challenge and change. Uh, Charlie mentioned earlier about the report to the community, which we issued earlier. I think it's a, a really a strong step in the right direction of graphically and pictorially and with proper kinds of, of wording, telling the story of this institution. This is the second iteration. We look forward to others in the future. On your seat today, there's another writing tablet for you. We've gone from uh, uh, various levels of change. Now we're talking about being in a change. We hope for it will be useful to you. 19, uh, 2013 and 2014 was a year of accomplishment and distinction, but also one of adapting and of insight, of cultivating our talents, et cetera. And you saw as we came in today, the scrolling list of achievements, the men and women, the faculty, staff, and students, and what they've accomplished over the past year. But a couple of others I would like to highlight before we move on. One is that this year we awarded 1,088 scholarships from the Office of Development and the Foundation, totaling $637,000. We dramatically increased the faculty, staff, always central campaign giving rate. We're at 44%. The average for research one institutions across the country is 26%. It's not about how much you give, it's about how much you're involved, and your giving is telling us a great deal. And we're not done yet. We're not done with the campaign, but we're close, and we're not done yet in terms of the opportunities that we have to work together to create the outcomes we're looking for. You all know by now, thanks to Charlie and our colleagues, that for the sixth of seven years we have been nominated, or actually uh, claimed to be, a great college to work for by the Chronicle of Higher Education. And look at the notation on the bottom. We're on the honor roll. twice in those six years we've been put on the honor roll. And what that means, if you go to the Chronicle and look, under large institutions, which is what we are, how we are designated, there are nine other institutions in the country and us on that list. We didn't say it, what we were gonna be on that list, that's the Chronicle of Higher Ed. And there are 12 categories upon which you can be rated. You have to go above a certain threshold in order to be rated as on the honor roll, and you have to make a certain number of categories. We have nine of 12 categories, which is more than we've ever had. And there's only one other institution on the list that has more than we do. And we're in great company. University of Maryland, Baltimore County, Duke, uh, Baylor, and, and other really good institutions. This is about you. This is an honor roll about you, not about anything else. It's about this is the place where people can come not only to make a difference in the lives of others, but to grow and prosper and become the kind of professional and individual they're looking forward to becoming. And another accolade before we leave these that I'd like to just highlight. This year, the American Association of State Colleges and Universities, ASCU, our national organization, selected UCO as one of five, their term, exceptional institutions among its 440 members to help them frame a national message for state colleges and universities working with the national organization called Sage Communications. Thanks to Charlie Johnson, Mark Kinders, we, uh, they've been ably representing us during these months of collaborative interaction among the five and ask you. And as that report comes out and as this national effort goes forward, your university was one of the five institutions that helped frame that particular uh, message. And I'm so proud of you guys for what you've done and thank you all for making it possible for us to be exceptional and be so noted uh, by the American Association of State Colleges and Universities. There is so much I could cover with you today, and I'm going to be brief. Please understand I'm not trying to hopscotch on purpose, but we all have lives to live, and I know you have things to do, but so much has occurred. You know about the budget. This last year, I communicated with you on June 26th 
the day our budget was approved by the Oklahoma State Regents for Higher Education, and again on July 21st with information about the cabinet retreat. And at those times, I let you know that we went with an average increase in tuition and fees of 6.8%. It worked out to be $2.32 per day for each of our students. A portion of that increase, importantly for us, is dedicated to upgrading our technology infrastructure, our digital plumbing. plumbing. We have to have these means to be able to get done what we're doing, and I so appreciate Cynthia Rolf's efforts in keeping us focused, because there was a time, which we all remember, when I was provost here, that we were on the front end of technology, but technology has shifted and changed so dramatically. So we're going in the ground and in the ceilings and in every building, and the idea is, when this process is finished, we're gonna be ready to take on the continuing responsibilities that technology is serving up. So let me give you an example, as Cynthia told me. On any day, on any day at this university, up to 30,000 devices are competing for access to the web. When I told that to the, to the Board of Regents, they were astounded. They had no idea. How could they, well, figure it out. How many of these things do you have, right? Okay, enough said. The idea is, is that we must stay ahead. This is part of adapting to the challenge of change. It was over the same period that we created new partnerships, so important in our role in the Metro. Those partnerships include, as John had mentioned, the Central Oklahoma Regional Educational Network known as CORE, and I really thank Dr. Jim Mackle, the Dean of the College of Education and Professional Studies for keeping us right in the midst of that. We are connecting very closely with Oklahoma City Public Schools and with Oklahoma City Community Colleges and all the community colleges in order to create the kind of vertical learning system, vertical education system that the Metro desperately needs. And I'm so pleased that we have a new and energetic leader at Oklahoma City Public Schools. His name is Superintendent Rob, new NEU. You'll get to know him. He's just accepted to be on our Council of Advisors. He's a dynamic uh, gentleman with lots of experience coming to us from Washington State. We're looking forward to having him as, a, as a, great, a great partner. At the legislature, there was good and bad news, depending on what time you read the news. Uh, at one point, it looked we, as if we were going to be dramatically cut. Uh, even though at the beginning of our work, we thought we'd try to ask for, as a system, for $78 million in new money. That didn't materialize, but we were spared a dramatic cut. However, when we don't receive any increase, we actually de facto are cut, as uh, Don Cruchel and others would be able to tell you, and that simply is we have ongoing costs. Those kinds of costs that we all have in our lives, pension plans, health care, unemployment compensation, et cetera. So we started out sort of $3.8 million technically in the hole, and that's one of the reasons for the increase in, in tuition and fees. And for the last seven years, legislation has been introduced trying to have guns on campus. Thus far, connecting with other Oklahoma universities and colleges, we've been able to deflect these attempts. But the issue, ladies and gentlemen, is not going away. The forthcoming session may be the most challenging of all. We are determined to keep guns off this campus. What When I read the uh, press releases uh, quoting apocryphal data, and when it's finally put into the light, clear light of day and reality and accuracy, I have but one question. My question is, just what problem are you trying to solve? What problem are you trying to solve? I want to thank Mark Kinders and others for ably representing us in the area of, um, of, global, I mean, of, of governmental affairs. I'd like now to share with you briefly some of the major capital projects underway on the campus. Um, this is a great deal of joy for all of us because while the marrow of this campus is the individual, we have to have the right facilities in which to carry this out. And what you see here is a rendering of the, uh, what I'm calling the Transformative Learning Residence Hall. It doesn't have a name, but if you look north of the College of Business uh, where, where Ayers and, uh, and Chowning meet, you will see it. And here's some of the, some of the work that's going on. Actually, it's even advanced from this point of, of a couple of days ago. Uh, soon we'll have 440 resident students uh, in a transformative learning environment. We also have the, um, the CHK Central Boathouse, the boathouse down on the, on the river, which we went and visited the other day. As you can see, this is the final rendering, and this is what's happening at this particular point. It is changing right before our eyes. Much of this coming to fruition in 2015. The Mitchell Hall addition to the College of Fine Arts and Design is going to be an amazing um, addition to our ability to give the appropriate space for our incredible faculty and staff in this area. We are remarkable in this area 
we are. And I'm so pleased that, as you can see, the world is going to change a bit for them uh, thanks to their hard work. Uh, the Old North Renaissance. I told you that I was the guy that had to close this thing as provost, and I'm very pleased to be back to work hard to help bring it back to life. Not just because we need the space, which is important, but this building is our part of our soul and we'll have involvement not just from the College of Education, which is absolutely important, but all colleges will be participating in usage of the state-of-the-art classrooms and the other. On the outside, it's going to look as you see it right now, and on the inside, it's going to tell a story, a story of change, a story of opportunity, and a story of an institution that is 125 years young. We're also going to proceed, thank you so much, people at the College of Liberal Arts, uh, uh, Dean Stewart, with the Pegasus renovation, which I don't have a slide for today, and also the IT infrastructure, which I mentioned to you. And the last but not least is the continuing advanced negotiations on the location of the medical examiner's complex and office. This is a rendering that does not necessarily represent what it will look like, but it's, it's a massive project. Um, it, it has all kinds of contours to it but I thank everyone that's been involved in helping us move this project forward. We have a wonderful partner in the medical examiner, Dr. Eric Pfeiffer. We look forward to working very closely with him and from his program being tightly associated with our College of Math and Science and our Forensic Science Institute. Some other changes you might have noticed, uh, there's been additional signage on campus, and there are a couple of wonderful, um, wonderful pieces of sculpture, one that's in place. Uh, we'll go with this, <laughs> that one. This is the Olympic body, body, mind, body, and spirit. I don't know if you've been out at, uh, to the, um, the area where this is, where we have the, uh, the wellness center, the fitness center. I'll call it the fit. But this is a replica, obviously smaller, of the piece of sculpture that sits at the United States Olympic Committee in, in Colorado Springs. It is full, these figures are full size there if you've been there and so taken by this piece. We're one of the few universities that enjoys this amazing relationship with the USOC and We've been able, working with people from the city of Edmond and the Edmond Matching Program, to have this lovely piece of work join us. And soon, probably somewhere later in the fall, this piece of sculpture, which was standing out in front of uh, the Houston Astrodome for many years, called Touch the Clouds, a famous um, uh, clan leader from the Sioux Nation, uh, will be placed on our campus in a place that I think will be appropriate. The city of Edmond is paying for it and paying the freight and taking care of it. And, we have the best site for them, and so we're looking forward to having them join us as well. And last in this area is, of course, next year, 125, the year when we are going to celebrate just how young we are as an institution. We're going to spend from January to December not only bringing many of these projects to fruition that I've just mentioned to you, but we're also going to be highlighting the incredible talents that we have here, individuals and groups and organizations. We're going to tell the world much more about who we are. We're going to invite others to join us. We'll have some uh, highlighted personalities, speakers and scholars and performers of renown. But the real highlight for me is you and your students and what they do and how they do it. So I really thank Ann Holzberline and her executive committee for moving us along. Uh, these great stories we'll be able to tell about illuminating the past and also reveal the, the character uh, of this institution. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I mentioned to you earlier that the challenges are swirling around us, and I think about often the depth and the pace uh, of change. It's something that uh, I guess sort of is a passion for me because I watch constantly how people react uh, with question marks to change and how they adjust or find their appropriate place in a world of change. We know that through the power of technology and other realities that we are li living with a, a change in, on a massive scale. And part of that change is connection. Ken Parker from Next Thought Incorporated here in Oklahoma City tells us that in 2013, 40% of the world was already online. And that number, number had doubled in just five years. And The Economist just this summer commented with a series of articles on just what the challenges are. They talked about creative destruction, about disruptive technology, and ominously, is there a future for universities? They talked about the revolution that was affecting our future, the revolution of rising costs and changing demand and disruptive technology. And they talked about that technology is really the force that's going to have the biggest impact on higher education. Uh, technology is changing the world by connecting people. And we embrace technology at the University of Central Oklahoma as tools, wonderful, powerful tools. 
in the hands of our teachers and our mentors and our guides and our students. So this is a time of exploration and experimenting in this age of disruption and this age of connection. We might say we are at the vortex of change. And there are many that are, dem are debating the notion, is there a place for higher education at this time? There are there's a great deal of sophistry abounding in the land these days about, about the roles of higher education. In the Chronicle of Higher Education just this summer, there was an article that says, when we cherry pick the scariest stories and numbers, we open the door to hucksters selling easy answers and we forget what college really is for. These flash in the pan schemes I submit to you depreciate the idea of what college ought to be about in the first place. They are about, and we are about, larger purposes. College, we declare our commitment to the idea that students could be transformed, to lead lives of meaning and purpose, and about the need to cultivate a democracy with an educated citizenry. And a brand new book, just out by William Duresevitz, called Excellent Sheep, The Miseducation of the American Elite uh, and the way, uh, a way to a Meaningful Life, he's a longtime faculty member at Yale, critiqued harshly Americans, America's elite schools, and he posits that education should be focused on something else, that they're looking at the wrong goals. He called for an increase in intellectual curiosity and, remembering John's words a few moments ago, more emphasis on intentional cultivation of character. Oscar Wilde counseled us that the true perfection of man lies not in what he has, but in what he is. These assertions are not new to us. Um, we know our expressed purposes at this institution, and we are pursuing continuous growth and development in the context of transformative learning and the Central Six. But education helps us in a great way by forming a common identity. It brings together bonds of affection, connection, and compassion. It builds societies, and that's what we're about here today. This university, ladies and gentlemen, stands for something. This place matters, and so do the people who have pledged to serve here with their fullest measure of ability, acumen, and passion. We are committed to equality and opportunity in an era of economic inequality and cutbacks and misguided perceptions of what we're about. Our express intention is to graduate life learners who are career and citizen and life ready. And Clay Christensen in his book, The Innovative University, says great universities of today and tomorrow will honor their histories while they also change for the future. So we, I believe, are the new American university, one of, I'm sure, several. And this is what we believe in. We're an institution dedicated to access and affordability, to quality and relevance, to teaching informed and enhanced by research, attuned to the needs of the people and the place. And it's in this place that we are the integrated actor and the collaborative partner, shaping the future of the region by what we do and what we don't do. This is our, our clarion call. I asked you in today and those little booklets to be the change, because we are the change we will see around us. We'll steer that change by the light of our mission, our vision, and our values, and by the value added meaning added to the work we pursue together. We are a 21st century living, learning, caring community in progress. Bill Clinton once told us that we all do better when we work together. Our differences matter, but our common humanity matters more. Being the change here means modeling the way in a time of confusion, distraction, mendacity, and deception. Self-proclaimed realists will listen to us and they would contend that we are idealists, driven by something that cannot be. Our reply is to look at our history to 125 years, to our service as a beacon of enlightenment over portions of three centuries and to our vibrant economic community today. If we are dreamers, then let's embrace the shared dream of helping others' dreams come true of becoming the change in the lives of so many who are seeking a meaningful life. But not all dreamers are idle or foolish. T.E. Lawrence, the author of Seven Pillars of Wisdom, left us with this notion to ponder. He said, all men dream, but not equally. 
Those who dream by night in the dusty recesses of their minds wake in the day to find out that it was vanity. Ah, but the dreamers of the day are dangerous men, for they may act on their dreams with open eyes to make them possible. We, I submit to you, are those dreamers of the day, the realistic optimists who prepare and connect to help fulfill the dreams of others by helping them learn. And in the process, we fashion lives of purpose and meaning for ourselves. So our students will pass through the Gateway Arch at Old North with their dreams, some articulated, but many lying half-formed in the private recesses of their minds and hearts. Yes, I believe we are the dangerous daydreamers dedicated to guiding the elements of change and to coaxing our students into the light and their goals, into the light of possibility and accomplishment. We are their mentors and their allies, their teachers and their guides. Many of you are the archetypes, the models of what we should do and who we should be during the moments of our lives on this planet. We are the University of Central Oklahoma, a community of learners and leaders with a passion for learning excellence and compassionate service. Ladies and gentlemen, we know why we are here. My sincere gratitude and appreciation to each one of you, and I wish you an incredible fall. Thank you.